lines the shelves. For giving gifts so thoughtful, you'll outdo the elves. If you want a Christmas you'll always remember, this is the place to spend less and gift better. TJ Maxx, Marshalls, and Home Goods. Happening now. Thanksgiving weekend may not have been what you're accustomed to, but turns out a countywide curfew could have done some good on the roads. A look at the number of suspected DWI and DUI arrests this year. The city leaders discussing how best to help those hit hard by the pandemic. Their plans coming up next. The White House Coronavirus Task Force releasing a new report today. The warning they have for the American people. And what election officials in Georgia are asking President Trump to do as he continues to deny the election results in that very state. And we actually had a cold front move through just a bit ago. I'm going to be back to let you know what that means for your temperatures tonight. And we have some changes for the weekend forecast to talk about coming right up. The News at 5 starts right now. First at five, Texas set to receive more than 1.4 million COVID-19 vaccines this month. That's according to Governor Greg Abbott and the Centers for Disease Control. The vaccine expected to arrive the week of December 14th. They'll be distributed to qualifying providers who will administer them based on state recommendations to people who volunteer to be immunized. More doses are expected to be made available later this month and through January. We have much more to bring you on the fight against COVID-19 coming up, but first. The pandemic and a countywide curfew, making for a very different Thanksgiving weekend for a lot of people in San Antonio. And it had at least one immediate effect. With more people forced to stay home and avoid gathering with the whole family, it appears less people were out driving drunk this year. According to the San Antonio Police Department, in 2019, 105 suspected intoxicated drivers were arrested between the day before Thanksgiving and the Sunday after it. This year, that number dropped more than half to only 46 people arrested. The latest drunk driving arrest happened on Sunday. A young man who would have turned 21 this month died after he was hit while crossing Nacogdoches Road. The driver arrested on an intoxication manslaughter charge and is being held on a $75,000 bond. Do you recognize this person? San Antonio police are trying, rather San Marcos police are trying to track him down after they say he robbed a convenience store on Sunday. The department shared these photos with us in hopes of trying to catch him. It happened at the Sunoco in the 1200 block of Highway 80 in San Marcos. Investigators say the suspect went into the store, flashed what looked like a stainless steel lug wrench at the cashier. You then saw that picture of him jumping over the counter and demanding the register be opened and took cash. A second employee said the suspect waved the same weapon at him, though he never used it to harm either employee. He's now wanted for aggravated robbery. If you have any information on who this might be, contact Detective Dawson with the San Marcos Police Department at 512-753-2315. We want to give you some new details on a deadly shooting from Monday night. We've learned the man who was shot several times at an apartment complex on the city's west side has now been identified as 35 year old John Eric Garcia. It happened at the Vista Meadow Apartments on Callahan near Calabra Road. Garcia was found by officers who were already at the complex for another call. They say the suspect shot him, then drove off. At last check, the suspect has not been arrested. Garcia was pronounced dead at the scene. It's still lots of questions after an overnight shooting that sent one man to the hospital. It happened about 2.30 this morning off of I-10 in the medical center area. A 31-year-old man shot in the chest and face while he was sitting in his car. Officers tell us someone sitting in another car shot him. The victim taken to the hospital in stable condition. He says he doesn't know the shooter or the type of car that that person was driving. No arrests have been made. A space heater may be to blame for causing a house fire on the west side this morning. It happened on San Carlos Street and South Zarzamora at around 10 o'clock. San Antonio firefighters say a woman and a child were sleeping here when the fire started. They heard a crackling noise coming from the wall. They made a call for help and got out safely. No one was injured. The home, however, did sustain fire and smoke damage. Investigators believe it was an electrical issue with that space heater. And don't forget, the Bear County Fire Marshal's office says when you are using a space heater, you should always unplug it when you're leaving the room or going to bed. Use one with an automatic shutoff and keep the heater away from any items that might catch fire. Chief Warrant Officer 3, Dallas Garza, 
laid to rest this morning. The 34 year old died in a helicopter crash in Egypt last month while on a peacekeeping mission. His funeral service was this morning at the community Bible Church. Garza served in the U.S. Army for 14 years. Election officials in Georgia demanding President Trump stop undermining the results of their election. This as one election official says people in his office are afraid for their lives and receiving death threats. ABC's Andrew Dimbert has more. Denying defeat, President Trump still not publicly acknowledging he lost the 2020 election, tweeting without proof, rigged election. With a Senate runoff race in Georgia coming up next month and control of the chamber at stake, GOP election officials in the state passionately pleading to the president to tone it down. Be the bigger man here and stop, step in, tell your supporters, don't be violent, don't intimidate. All that's wrong, it's un-American. Sterling says he became angry after a 20 year old election contract worker began receiving death threats and a noose with his name on it. Georgia's Republican Secretary of State also scolding Trump after he mockingly retweeted Sterling's passionate news conference. Even after this office request that President Trump try and quell the violent rhetoric, he tweeted out, expose the massive voter fraud in Georgia. This is exactly the kind of language that is at the base of growing threat environment for election workers who are simply doing their jobs. Adding to the growing chorus undercutting Trump's false claims of fraud, U.S. Attorney General Bill Barr. Barr stating that the Department of Justice to date has not seen fraud on a scale that could have affected a different outcome in the election. Trump's campaign lawyers hitting back at Barr, saying his, quote, opinion appears to be without any knowledge or investigation of the substantial irregularities and evidence of systemic fraud. To date, Trump and his allies have lost at least 31 different election cases. Andrew Dimbert, ABC News, Washington. All right, here's a live look outside as that sun is lowering in the sky. We're about 30 minutes away, 40 minutes away from sunset here on this Wednesday afternoon and the wind has picked up. We had a cold front move through, so you notice that gusty northwesterly wind steady at 13 miles per hour gusting up to 26 right now, still 63 degrees, but that stiff northwesterly wind will push some cooler air into town and we'll notice it later on tonight. Right now we've got some 50s in the hill country, West Kerrville at 57. We're 71 in Floresville, meanwhile, 62 in Bulverde, Michael checking in at 61. Temperatures falling off quickly this evening by 10 p.m. down in the mid 40s. Jacket weather tonight, even cooler tomorrow morning. I'll let you know where we could see a freeze coming right up. Thank you, Adam. City leaders discussing how to help those hit hardest during the pandemic today. The topic, helping those who have lost their jobs using the SA Ready to Work initiative. The goal is to help residents get the skills and education they need for jobs that are high paying and in demand right now. A presentation shown with financial projections and a timeline on how they hope that initiative would play out. Not everyone happy with the plan, though. Council members spoke about instead of creating a new division for this program, why not fund organizations that are already doing the work? It has always been doing like after school programming and child care and uh, back to work programs and uh, tutoring and all those things that our families need uh, to be able to be competitive um, in today's um, market. The SA Ready to Work initiative will be funded through a one eight cent sales tax, which was approved by voters in the November election. The week after Thanksgiving, some new warnings from the White House Coronavirus Task Force in its weekly report to the states. The group says the COVID risk to all Americans is at a historic high. Meanwhile, as Karen Kafa explains, Congress talking more seriously about a financial relief bill more seriously than they have in months. A dramatic, dire assessment from the White House Coronavirus Task Force to states, writing in a weekly report, we are in a very dangerous place due to the current extremely high COVID baseline and limited hospital capacity. A further post-Thanksgiving surge will compromise COVID patient care as well as medical care overall. <laughs> doctors nationwide are bracing for the worst. Every doctor's worst fear is that patients come to us and we can't give them the best care. 
We can't give them everything they need to take care of them. Urgency also felt on Capitol Hill as lawmakers resume talks about getting Americans some sort of financial relief soon. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says he's working on a bill that would include more small business funding and an extension of the federal unemployment benefits set to expire at the end of the year. In the last several days, the Democratic leaders have signaled a new willingness to engage in good faith. Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin said President Trump would sign McConnell's bill. Meanwhile, the CDC has laid out priority groups, medical workers and long-term care facilities residents for the first wave of vaccines expected to reach states before Christmas. I think states are getting ready. They've been working on their plans now for a couple months. On Wednesday, the UK approved Pfizer-BioNTech's vaccine, the first Western country to sign off on a COVID-19 vaccine. In Washington, I'm Karen Kefa. Meantime, there are some new recommendations from the CDC for those in quarantine. Quarantines can now end after 10 days for people who have been exposed to COVID-19 but aren't showing symptoms and have not been tested. For those who were exposed but don't have symptoms and have a negative test, quarantine can end after seven days. That's according to new guidelines from the CDC. The World Health Organization has some new recommendations for mask wearing. They now say people 12 and older should wear masks when they can't keep a three foot distance from others. That goes for both indoor and outdoor settings. The WHO says wearing masks alone, not enough. You should continue sanitizing hands, keeping physical distance and avoid touching your face. The only time the WHO suggests not wearing a mask during vigorous physical activity especially if you have asthma. And it's no secret the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted all of our lives in one way or another this year. It's why this month we here at KSAT and Trinity University are taking a look at the impact the pandemic has had on the community and where we go from here. We want you to be part of that conversation as well. Tonight we are live streaming part one of a three part series on the COVID pandemic. We're going to be speaking with panelists of experts about transmission, how the virus impacted marginalized communities, and of course, the timeline for a vaccine. The conversation starts tonight at 630 online and on air. You can watch during the news at six and then follow along on ksat.com at seven. American Airlines taking the first steps to return Boeing 737 Max jet to the skies. Today, the airline took 100 journalists on a flight from Dallas Fort Worth International to Tulsa, Oklahoma. The jets were grounded for about a year and a half after two crashes killed more than 340 people. The FAA gave approval for the jets to fly again last month. So far, American Airlines is the only one to put its jets back on the schedule. The trees, garland, lots of lights, decorating for Christmas might still be on your holiday to-do list. And if you're looking for a way to lighten things up a little differently this year, how about smart light kits? Would they do the trick, what to look for, and how they can make your holiday home a little more magical? Next. This essay salute holiday greeting is brought to you by Blue Ribbon Auto Collision Center. Hi, I'm Adolf, owner of Blue Ribbon Auto Collision in San Antonio. I would like to take a moment to thank all the men and women in the armed forces and all the first responders. Thank you for your service and sacrifice. God bless you, God protect you, wishing you a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. We want to bring you some late breaking news. Sky 12 now flying over the 900 block of Sims Avenue that's not too far from Somerset Road. They are telling us that police are on the scene of some sort of incident. Uh, they are uh, giving us more information in just a few minutes and we will update this story as soon as we get it. Well, it's the season for lighting up the holidays. And no, you don't have to be Clark Griswold to create a dazzling display. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz says smart light kits can do the trick. And a simple smart plug may be all the holiday help you need. Jeffrey Staples, a former theater techie, puts on quite the show. And I always wanted to put on like uh, a, a light show, synchronized to music in the theater, but I didn't have the technology to do it. He does now, and he's turned that dream into a holiday side hustle. Even if you don't have the tech skills that Jeffrey has, there are products to help manage your lights and kits that can bump up the fun. The simplest way to control your holiday lights is honestly with a smart plug. They're really affordable. You can set them to 
uh, turn on and off with your local sunset and sunrise times. Smart plugs cost from $15 to $65. You'll want one that's Wi-Fi capable. Just plug it into a wall outlet, plug your lights into the device, and you can then control your lights from your smartphone. If outdoors, get one rated for outdoors. Want to do more? There are several light kits that can change colors, create effects, and let you set your lights to music. They do require some tech skill, and they cost more than regular lights, 60 to $200. They're a lot of fun. They definitely provide that, you know, whimsy that I think a lot of people could use right now, but there were some hiccups. This Lumations holiday music light show set was the easiest of the bunch to set up. While the kits don't come close to Jeffrey's productions, they might bring some of the same holiday delight. The kids just, you know, their eyes light up and they're smiling and really enjoying it. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Smart lights. That seems like something Adam Kasky would yeah. be all about. Is that what your front yard looks like? No, you would think. <laughs> you would. But the traditionalist in me, uh, I still have a lot of just the incandescent bulbs because they're cheaper, you know, and, yeah. and have them on a timer. But anyway, but I do wrap those oaks pretty tightly. Oh, yes, I do. All right, we have a lot of weather to talk about. We had a cold front move through earlier today, so we made it to 70 right before the cold front hit. That's above average. Our low was pretty much exactly average at 43, but not as cold as a few nights ago. Earlier this morning, we were largely upper 30s to low 40s. Not a big deal. Different, though, later on tonight. So let's get right to it. Look at the temperatures. That cold front, it has passed through. And you look at the wind across the state and upstream or where the wind is coming from, we have temperatures in the 30s to near 40. So that cooler air is getting pushed southward and is going to move into San Antonio. Now, I don't think we'll hit freezing in town, but there will be some exceptions to that. Currently, we're in the 60s. It's comfortable outside, still beautiful, sunny 60s and 50s in the hill country. But you notice that wind and that wind is blowing in the cooler air. So I'm thinking tomorrow morning, 35 San Antonio, 34 Uvalde, 36 Del Rio, close to a freeze, but probably just a few degrees shy of it, with the exception of the hill country, Kerrville, Fredericksburg 31, Bandera about the freezing point as well. Lake Hills and Bernie, it's going to be close, probably within a degree. But the vast majority of us in the mid 30s tomorrow morning and get used to the 30s. They're here to stay. So have the jacket hanging next to the door or ready to go in the closet every night, every morning, all the way through the weekend and even into the middle part of next week. So we have that gusty northwesterly wind and it's blowing in even drier air as if the air wasn't dry enough. But dew points did briefly get to 50 earlier today and now some even drier air is moving into town. Get used to the dry air. If it gives you the, the chapped lips, the dry skin, this is going to stay in place all the way through the next seven days at least. Winds are gusting between 20 and 30 miles per hour at the moment. It's going to be breezy for the first part of the evening, but the, then the wind is going to subside. And tonight, just a north wind at about 10 to 15 miles per hour. So we picked up a few showers on the radar. Far eastern counties, Lavaca County, Victoria County earlier today, the real activity. East Texas moving into Louisiana. Look at that, our friends in the panhandle. A little bit of snow there. It's a sign of the season, isn't it? it? It is December. Upper level low pressure system helping to generate all that activity. We just don't have enough moisture overhead for us to get any of those showers. Now, what's interesting here, over the next couple of days, that upper low is going to split and we'll have perfect positioning for an upper disturbance in northern Mexico by Friday into Saturday. The problem is we just don't have enough moisture to work with. So I'm thinking a lot of cloud cover on Saturday. Notice the future cache shows a little bit of green here. I think that's mainly Virga where the rain evaporates before it hits the ground. But West Texas could actually get a little snow from that system. 35 tomorrow morning, only into the mid 50s tomorrow afternoon. So this cold front setting the stage for a cooler day tomorrow with some high thin clouds. Friday morning 30s, afternoon in the 60s, Saturday near 60 with the extra clouds. And for the most part, we're looking at mornings in the 30s, afternoons in the 60s from here on out. Very pretty forecast. Thank you. All right. Even though they didn't make the playoffs, the Spurs did have some success in the bubble. Yes. Is that style of play going to carry over to this season? Yes. And it will mostly affect a guy like LaMarcus Aldridge, you remember, who did not play in the bubble because he right. injured his shoulder and had surgery. When we come back, we'll hear from LaMarcus for the very first time since the pandemic shut down all of sports last March. And can the Cowboys come back with five games left? <laughs> I wouldn't bet on it. Coming up.
San Antonio Spurs continue their training camp today with day two of working on their new game plan of small ball, the same plan that almost got them out of the lottery in the NBA bubble in Orlando. The one player having to make the biggest adjustment is LaMarcus Aldridge, who is about to start his 15th year in the NBA, is sixth with the Spurs. The up-tempo style will have LMA shooting more threes this season, something was working into his game last year when the pandemic hit. Aldridge finished at 39%, which is the second highest three-point shooting percentage in his career, but took more shots from long distance than he had in all of his pro basketball experience. This is also the first time we have heard from LaMarcus since the pandemic shut down all of sports last March, and Aldridge underwent surgery on his shoulder and missed the NBA bubble experience. Today, we found out how the 34-year-old is adjusting to the Spurs' new game plan. I'm excited. You know, it's uh, a fun uh, style of basketball. You know, I feel like I can, I can mesh and, you know, play any style that I need to, to, you know, try to help the team win games and uh, be better. So I'm looking forward to it. All right, three Spurs are missing the start of training camp and possibly the start of the season later this month. Derek White is still recovering from toe surgery. Keldon Johnson has foot injury, and Quindary Weatherspoon is recovering from knee surgery. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The Dallas Cowboys will get some extra days to prepare for their showdown with the Ravens in Baltimore. Their game has been moved to Tuesday at 7 p.m., the first time in the history of the Cowboys they have actually played on a Tuesday. That's because the Ravens game against Pittsburgh had to be moved to today due to an outbreak of COVID-19 that affected over 30 players and staff with reports of no more positive tests today, even though Pittsburgh had to play center Marquise Pouncey on the COVID-19 reserve list after he tested positive. The focus now has to be on finishing following the 41 6 route on Thanksgiving Day to Washington. But now the Cowboys have a unique opportunity to watch the Ravens play live this afternoon while preparing to face them next week. And we're going to watch it in our position space, you know, where we can spread out and, and be comfortable and, you know, just collaborate. You know, you frankly, you never really have an opportunity to, to watch your next opponent play live after, a, you know, after an installation day. So the fact that we're, I mean, we've all watched Monday night games before, but, you, you know, rarely do you get to watch a game live after you're, you're, you're you know, two days into your preparation. That's right. And the students right now are winning. They're watching that 19-7 to 7 in the four-quarter highlights for tonight on the Night Beat. All right. Thank you, Greg. You we'll be right back. It is a fatal shooting. Let's get back to that late-breaking news we briefly told you about a moment ago. We can confirm San Antonio police have responded to a shooting in the 900 block of Sims Avenue. It's on the southwest side, not far from Somerset Road. The San Antonio Fire Department tells us that a person was found dead on arrival. Unclear at this time what exactly went on here. We're working to get some more details for you, and we're going to bring them to you on the news at 6. We'll feel the chill tonight and tomorrow morning with temperatures in the 30s, but with the exception of the hill country, it looks like we'll be just above freezing in the morning, but a cool day tomorrow only in the 50s with some high clouds, low humidity for the next seven days at least. Very dry air in place, so no shot at rain. Thank you, Adam, and thank you for watching the news at 5 with us. See you back here at 6.